Wildlife gardening is a topic that is of great interest in the UK. And it's been increasing in interest recently. In 2020, a survey by the Wildlife Gardening Forum found that 84% of gardeners surveyed do something to help with wildlife in their garden. And during the 2020 lockdowns, the RSPB found an enormous surge on their webpage for how to build a bird box. And most recently, this picture behind me, which is the rewilding Britain landscape, which won Best in Show at Chelsea in 2022. But how many of the claims that are made in all the YouTube videos, magazines and books can be taken as fact? Which of them are a waste of time and which of them have actually been studied and demonstrated to be effective? One of the problems with saying scientific wildlife gardening is that the amount of science that's been done on the ecology of gardens is fairly slim. Actually a lot of it will be down to your own personal experience. I'm not here to criticise that. So I'll take you through the things that have been studied and the results of those, and particularly we'll go through some of the stuff that is very often repeated as though it's fact, but has never been demonstrated to be true. And first of all, let's agree on what we mean by wildlife-friendly garden. The wildlife that I'm going to predominantly focus on is the invertebrate wildlife that you're going to find in your garden, and that's because there's a far greater number of different species in that group than there are of, say, large animals and mammals and birds. If you were to take birds, for example, and you counted all of the ones that even just fly overhead in your garden, you might be lucky to count 40 if you're, say, in the southeast of the UK. Among the insects, there are nearly 2,000 species that you can find in a British garden. So if you're going to find a diversity of species, I think it's better to focus on the species that are more abundant in number. And it makes sense to study the invertebrates because they're not disconnected from the vertebrates. We've all seen blue tits and robins eating insects in the garden. So if you've got a fair variety of invertebrates, then you're going to have a variety of vertebrates too. But given that there's such a limited number of vertebrates that you could actually count in a garden, it would be difficult to study them fairly. With all that said, as an introduction to this series, let's go and have a little perv on some gardens and see which are good and which are not so good to get you a bit of a feel for what we're talking about. And I know that this is a bit of public land, however, one of the reasons why gardens haven't been studied very much is because they're pretty hard to access. So places like this are used and then you can extrapolate that to gardens because these places are much better studied. Let's have a look, because you could extrapolate this to a garden. Fairly short grass, some trees. It's going to be okay. There's some hairy bittercress flowering. There's some geraniums in here. Uh, I can also see a bit of ragwort and a number of different other weeds. So there's a, fair, there's a fair amount of floral diversity and the grass is allowed to get long enough that it flowers, which means that there are a far greater number of species that can actually use that grass. At the margins here, they spray all of this with glyphosate, which means that it kills all the plants that are here. So the lower amount of floral diversity, you're going to have a much smaller amount of animal diversity too. Clearly, if a garden is entirely paved over or covered in plastic artificial grass, it's going to have a lot less diversity than even a short clip lawn. You have to let your garden go completely wild for it to be as wildlife friendly as possible, like this. And does the planting choice, like green alkanet, nettles and buddleia, influence the amount of wildlife you're going to find? Most of what we know about wildlife gardening comes from the bug study, which is Biodiversity and Urban Gardens in Sheffield, conducted by Ken Thompson and his colleagues at Sheffield University, and Jennifer Owen, who conducted a 30-year study of her own garden in Leicester. So in order to understand this small wildlife, entomologists and ecologists need to trap the insects that they're trying to find or the invertebrate. So there is that limitation that only the insects that would be trapped are the ones that you're going to find because some of them might be smart enough to evade the traps. And from the bug study we know that although those gardens that have been left to go completely wild are good for wildlife they're not uniquely good for wildlife and it's primarily down to the fact that there's an abundance and variety of vegetation that's there. So a fairly standard approach to British gardening is also pretty good for wildlife, given that you don't use tons of pesticides. 
and you have a variety of plants in your garden. So that's good news if you didn't want your garden to be completely overgrown. So people were getting a little bit spooked by me being like outside their house with a camera. So I've come back to my garden. Hopefully we've got enough visual storytelling for you to understand the different types of gardens that I might be talking about. So we understand that gardens don't really necessarily have to be specifically wild in order to be valuable to nature. You can grow garden cultivars of plants if you want to and you can garden in a fairly ordinary way and that seems to be compatible with an abundance of invertebrate life in your garden. And one of the things that really makes no difference whatsoever it seems is how big your garden is and how close you are to an urban centre. In the bug study they had some gardens that were on the edge of the Peak District and they had some gardens that were in the middle of Sheffield Town Centre and it made no difference to the abundance of invertebrate life that was in the garden. So if you're in the countryside it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have more wildlife in your garden. There may be more countryside wildlife that is there and some of those are actually a bit of a nuisance like rabbits and deer but essentially it makes sense because we know that lots of the wildlife that's been lost in this country has been as a result of the intensification of farming. So our countryside is now fairly depleted of wildlife, so it would then not be that much of an accolade to say that gardens are better than the countryside because the countryside is pretty crap for wildlife anyway. But also the size of the garden, and how was that studied? Well, in each of the gardens they had the same number of traps. They had the same, they had, I think it was two malaise traps and one pitfall trap. If a garden was bigger and it meant that it was better for wildlife, you'd expect to find a greater diversity or abundance of the invertebrates that were trapped, and you didn't. So essentially, small gardens act like small parts of large gardens, and coupled with your neighbour's gardens, because it's unlikely that your garden is completely in isolation, you have a fairly large garden anyway, because the wildlife doesn't know that you've put up boundaries and it's unaware of uh, property law as far as I know. Next time I'll go through how the planting choice can make a difference to the biodiversity you find in your garden, how it was studied and I'll go through some of the other things that you can implement in your garden which are pretty much cost free so there's no reason why you wouldn't do it but I'll go through the limitations in how that was studied too. If you're not interested in going on to watch the rest of the videos and you've demonstrated extremely poor taste but you are interested in wildlife gardening then I've linked some stuff in the description, some resources, free resources that you can go and use to learn a little bit more. The one that I use particularly in the making of this video is No Nestles Required by Ken Thompson where he explains the studies that he's done in a manner that is appropriate for lay people like you and me to be able to understand. These studies were done about 2000 to 2002 and yet every week in the garden media they're repeating the same things that have been demonstrated to not be true over 20 years ago. What's unique about the studies that he presents in the book is the fact that they're all done on gardens and it's quite remarkable on the basis that it's really difficult to access gardens because you have to get loads of different private access and the studies were done over the course of two years. Ken writes in a really funny way, so it's worth reading just for, for the sake of that alone. And it's a really good central resource if you're just wanting to understand a little bit more about the ecology of gardens. Really hope you found this useful and I'll see you in the next video and we'll go through some more stuff that you can do to actually improve your garden for wildlife. The good news is it costs pretty much nothing and it takes a fairly minimal amount of effort 